Well, uh, thank you for coming out on a blustery night. Uh, and welcome to Digital Photography's i3 lecture series. We are delighted to have Natan Vir as tonight's guest speaker. Originally from Israel, Natan received his MBA from Tel Aviv University and his MFA in photography from SVA. Uh, we love to see alumni come back to the lecture series. Um, Natan is best known for documentary and editorial work portraying individuals living in societies torn apart by political and economic upheaval. He is represented by Polaris Images and Anastasia Photo Gallery. His photographs have been featured in publications across the world, including the New York Times, Newsweek, the Wall Street Journal, the Sunday Times, Le Monde, Figaro, Journal de Dimanche, Stern, Corriere, Corriere de la Sera, and Wallpaper, among others. His work has been exhibited at the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Cleveland, Blue Sky Gallery, Schneider Gallery, Houston Center for Photography, Museo de Antioquia, Christie's London, and the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. In 2012, he received the Award of Excellence at Picture of the Year Award and the Best, <coughs> Best Feature Series from PDN Annual. In 2011, he received two honorable mentions from the International Photography Award. And in 2010, he won the first prize for Social Documentary Essay from the New York Photography Festival was named to the Critical Mass Top 50 and won the Picture of the Year Award in the Israeli press. Natan's latest exhibition, Coming Soon, opens at Anastasia Photo Gallery next week, Tuesday, March 19th, and is highly recommended. Please join me in welcoming Natan Vir. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm blushing right now. Um, thank you very much, Jaime, for this long introduction, didn't know that I did that. Uh, and thank you, Katrine and Jaime, for inviting me to speak here. Um, as uh, Jaime just mentioned, I myself am a graduate of the photography department, so I always remember uh, being on the other side uh, when I was a student, always wondering how it might feel, you know, just to come to the SVA and talk. It's the first time it's happening. I have to say it's nice, uh, but it's also uh, very rewarding in terms of giving back. So I'm really thankful for being invited here. Especially uh, to share with you guys, uh, as you're going to see at the end, uh, the latest body of work which started when I was at the SVA. So it's kind of also closing, uh, closing a circle. Um, I'm an Israeli photographer. I'm, uh, I just turned 40 a few months ago. And photography was not my first career. This was my first career. Um, I'm, I have a bachelor's degree in computer science and economics and a master's degree in uh, business administration. And for many years, I was in computers. I was doing uh, research and development, as is written on this card, and then some product management. I found this card in somewhere stuck in my uh, uh, passport folder a few months ago, and thought that it's kind of a funny anecdote. Um, luckily, when I was 30 and I was bored with what I was doing and I just couldn't, couldn't wait to get out of it, I got a break and started uh, working for Time Out magazine. Oopa. And uh, very Did fast. You have it in Israel too? Yeah, actually, what happened was that I met uh, totally by chance a friend of mine that I used to teach when I was in, uh, in college. I used to give private lessons. And while we were catching up, uh, I was telling him that I hate my job and I'm looking for something else to do. Uh, I was telling him that I'm practicing photography as a hobby. And then he told me that Timeout just arrived in Israel. It was about four weeks, four or five weeks after Timeout just arrived. And he offered me a job. I thought that he was kidding, but uh, two weeks later, suddenly I found myself shooting my first assignment for timeout, not knowing anything about you know, what am I doing and how this system works. Uh, but I don't know, they liked it. So that led to another assignment and another assignment. And before I knew it, I that was the first cover, which was a few months later. Um, and things happened very, very fast. Uh, in about three, four months time, I found myself splitting my life between uh, the world of computers, waking up in the morning, photographing until six, uh, until seven, eight, nine, depending, heading to the office, working there in the mid, in the mid time, trying to uh, run away to do some assignments, leaving the office, heading out to another assignments, and the weekend was just photography. A few months later, well, all of this de developed within a framework of about eight months uh, since the wor first work was published. Um, everything in Tel Aviv and so. So 
<laughs> at, in 2003, August 2003, I went on assignment for two magazines to Burning Man Festival. If you haven't gone yet, go. <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing experience. It's a life-changing experience, at least for me. Uh, I went there photographing for, two, for Time Out and another uh, equivalent of National Geographic in Israel. Uh, coming back, I traveled through a festival called Visa pour l'image in uh, south of France that was focusing on documentary photography and uh, journalism. And I feel that things had to change. So I went back, had a talk with my boss, and uh, took a deep breath. Changed my life. Uh, and that was basically the best decision I've ever made, I think. I was thinking at the time, you know, I don't have a wife, I don't have kids, so if I make any big mistake, it's mine to make. And I didn't want to make the mistake of waking up when I was 50 saying I had the chance and I didn't take it. So I took it. Um, now, at the time I was living in Israel, uh, and one of the easiest things to photograph in Israel, or at least what we have quite a bit, is conflict, as you might know from the news. Uh, I started working as an editorial photographer and a photojournalist, and I was fascinated by the conflict. Uh, I photographed this either for my agency when I was starting to work there with uh, Polaris Images for various magazines, but I was mostly assigning myself. Whenever I heard about something going on, I would pick up the camera if I wasn't busy doing something else, and I would go photograph. And even at that early time, um, yes, yeah, some of the pictures were dramatic for, for the nature of what was happening, but I was much more interested in about the people and the environment, what, what was happening to them because of that conflict. What was, uh, I, I wasn't necessarily interested in the very dramatic pictures. I was more interested in, you know, how does this inflict their lives? This is, for instance, the, um, the, separa the separation barrier, the fa famous sep separation barrier between Israel and the West Bank uh, around Jerusalem. By the way, if anybody has any questions, just feel free to stop me at any time. Um, so this was basically the early years of my personal work. I didn't even regard it as personal work. I was just regarding it as I want to photograph, and so I was pushing myself. I, I, maybe in the back of my mind I was thinking portfolio, but there was no real body of work around it. Uh, this was taken in 2007, uh, 2006, sorry. Um, this, we were, I was there on assignment for a German magazine. This is the, cro the border crossing between Israel and Gaza, Eris Crossing. There was fighting there between the Hamas and Fatah, two um, Palestinian groups about um, owning Gaza, basically. And, and as night uh, started to fall, they were fighting around the, the crossing itself, like bullets were flying. All of the photographers are lying on the ground trying to, you know, not to get hit. And suddenly this guy comes, you know, grabbing his uh, bag and his package and says that he wants to cross. And I find myself trying to explain to him, you know, this is not the situation right now, but he said, like, I need to cross. So he goes over there and stands. And um, just before that, he explains to me what he has in this package. What he's carrying in the package is the body of his three-year-old baby that uh, passed away in an Israeli hospital that day. The doctors tried to save it, but they couldn't. It was a terminal situation. And that's ju just this kind of situation again that, you know, a picture speaks very softly, especially when you know the story behind it. This was kind of the things that I was looking for. The journalist actually went to the, to the military and tried to explain to them the, very na the, the sensitive situation here, and the guy was let in onto the other side in, as opposed to other people that were just held there. Um, all of these pictures were taken more kind of on a single event basis. I was not thinking of them as, even as a body of work. I was not thinking of myself as an artist at the time. I was a photojournalist. I was an editorial photographer. I was a guy trying to make good pictures. And also for me, an exhibition would be always a bunch of pictures, a good pictures, hopefully, that the photographer chose to put on the walls and share with the public. The, the idea of intention didn't, didn't really resonate at that time. Uh, I was totally self-educated. I worked with, uh, back in the days, with uh, Ziv Koren, which was uh, one, still is one of Israel's uh, main photojournalists, and beginning Getty Images and then Polaris Images. So, but the main thing that I was always drawn to was documentary photography. And that was the only course I actually ever took at that time, a short workshop in documentary photography. The first um, documentary project that I did was actually in Burning Man, the one that you see before, it was horrible. <laughs> I totally messed it up. But uh, the, the idea really stayed with me. And the first time I actually did a documentary project was in Shirat Hayam. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you guys remember or knew about this. In 2004 and 2005, in 2005 eventually, Israel evacuated <coughs> 25 settlements. 21 from, the, uh, from Gaza and uh, the Gaza Strip, and four from the West Bank. And it was a very dramatic time in the days of Israel. Uh, for me, 
it was uh, it was clear for me that this is a place that I do want to do a documentary project, mostly because I could not understand the settlers and why they were living in so, in those areas. I uh, took my camera and together with a photojournalist from a different uh, one of the magazines in Israel, uh, she took me to Gush Katif, which was Gaza, basically. And we drove around for a few hours there, going from one settlement to another. And I remember to myself, not understanding what actually I was seeing and not understanding why those people chose to live there. Eventually, we got to a place called Shirat Hayam, which means in Hebrew, Song of the Sea. And I photographed these two pictures. Uh, Shirat Hayam was a settlement of 16 families, Orthodox families, uh, living in caravans about 50 yards from the beach in a magical beach which used to be a resort for the uh, mil uh, um, Egyptian military before Israel conquered Gaza in 1967. So there were a line of caravans close to the beach and after those caravans there was a line of destroyed houses which used to be the recreation houses for the Egyptians. And 50 yards after that you would have a wall and a fence, an army. Why? Because right after that there would be thousands of Palestinians which were not very friendly. So those, those 16 families, young families, would take their children and everything and live on caravans on a strip of beach in the middle of nowhere. It didn't make sense. This is how they would go to the beach, with a gun. Um, and after traveling throughout uh, Gush Katif, especially Gaza, for a few months, trying to really understand what that place meant to me and what I wanted to see, eventually this project, as many of my other projects, kind of found me. Uh, it was obvious to me that that weird place called Shirat Ayam was where I wanted to photograph. And the story of that settlement for me is the story of that disengagement. Again, a lot of politics being involved, and this is a crazy time, both in the international news and the Israeli news. But for me, it was not about the, the politics or about the news. It was more about the human story behind the news. This is what I was wanting to focus. Now, you have a situation when I'm coming from Tel Aviv, which is a very left-wing liberal city, going to photograph people, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not religious to say the least, uh, I'm going to photograph people from the other end of the spectrum. Uh, people that want to keep their houses, see everybody else trying to evacuate them. When they get out of their caravans, they have about 50 ca five cameras uh, of different photographers snapping every movement that they are. Why? Because magazines are looking for pictures. So within all this kind of environment, I had to try to convince them that what I want to do is go into their lives and photograph from the next three hardest months of their lives. That was the challenge. And this is a challenge that us as photo documentary photographers, we always, obvious, a lot of time we face because we want to get into, we got, want to get access into people's life and convincing them is not an easy thing. What I did, uh, that was, it was just a, when we had the Independence Day and um, Memorial Day, I photographed it as best as I can. I printed 20 copies of 20 images, bounded it into booklets, and just knocked on the doors to give some presents. And which I really actually felt, you know, the pictures were nice on my computer, but they were much better in the hands of the people which will actually use them in years to come. And those knocks on the doors invited a conversation, and that conversation allowed me to explain what I wanted to do. And it was the beginning of a friendship. Uh, this is also from the Independence Day. On, and these are the caravans that you see here in the back. These are the 16, actually 18 caravans with the synagogue and kindergarten. Um, so in the years to, in, in the three months to come, I stayed with these uh, settlers uh, as much as I could. Whenever I was not working for Time Out or other uh, magazines, I would take two, three days a, a week. I would drive an hour and a half back and forth and photograph as much as I can. Um, getting much and much closer to people that I've never imagined myself being friends with. And vice versa, by the way. They were very suspicious at the beginning, uh, but eventually we, we are actually friends to this day. Um, this is just before the evacuation, a couple of days before the evacuation. They were already understanding that it gets more and more tense. Uh, this is the main family, the car family that I was living with. And behind them, by the way, is here is the caravan. This is the destroyed house of the Egyptian military, and this is the was separating them from the Palestinians. This is as close. Um, this was taken one day before the actual evacuation. At the time, they already knew that they were going to be evacuated. So this is the mother and the two daughters from the family that I was staying with. Um, basically, what you see here is a separation ceremony. They were living on the beach for five years, and for them, it was so traumatizing that they made a vow never to return to the beach again, which they haven't. Um, I remember when I was going to photograph this, the husbands were like, you cannot photograph this, this is not decent, you know, they're going to get wet. So I promised to, uh, to keep their privacy. 
And this is also part of the thing that I think is a critical, you know, as a documentary image maker, of really respecting your subjects uh, and your promises. That's the day of the evacuation itself, uh, just as the army was coming in. And last time I was there, I returned, photographed this, and uh, left what, for me, became one of the most monumental projects. Um, that whole experience of working with um, a group of people that were so different than me, especially religiously uh, and politically, got me to think a lot about you know, what moves people, what makes them do whatever or make those choices in life and what puts them in very crazy situations that I got to witness during that disengagement time. Looking back at my um, archive, I started looking at seeing that I was photographing a lot in, in uh, various political or uh, religious uh, situations. And I was fascinated, I, I tried to understand again, why was I so drawn to this? What was the source of interest? Uh, at the end I came to the conclusion that what, what, what interests me is the power of belief. Not necessarily religious belief, it can be gender, lifestyle, whatever you guys want. I used more religious and political just because it was comfortable in a way, or accessible. But how it, on one hand it supplies us, um, and gives us a sense of community, belonging, answers to our main questions in life, but on the other hand might push us to fanaticism, or situation that we would not otherwise find ourselves in. And this, is, this kind of exercise, this is what I tried to explore in this series, which I started working on, you know, after coming to that understanding, I started working on in a more deliberate way. Six months after the disengagement, this happened. Um, what you're seeing here is, uh, after those 21, 25 settlements were evacuated, uh, six months later, the Israeli Supreme Court ordered the destruction of nine illegal buildings in a West Bank, set Bank, Bas Bank? Uh, West Bank settlement called Amona. And uh, when the army came to destroy those houses, they were confronted by 4,000 uh, Jewish settlers that were coming there to make a point, saying we will not be evacuated again. This is um, the time where, the, as the army is entering the settlements itself, uh, it ended up with a very long day of confrontations with 200 people injured on both sides before those, those uh, buildings were destroyed. Two years later this happened. Uh, this is in the Holy Sepulchre Church. Um, during Easter you have thousands and thousands of pilgrims coming through and walking in the path of Jesus in the Via Dolorosa, eventually en ending up in the Holy Sepulchre Church which where it's believed uh, Jesus is uh, buried. Um, so this kind of imagery that again walks both uh, favorable or not so favorable Im uh, images, this is what I'm trying to actually explore. Um, obviously because of the relations, relations to uh, all kinds of religious uh, issues, I'm, I'm trying to connect it to some parts, well in art and especially religious art, um, and not necessarily focus on Judaism which is easier maybe because I come as a Jew, but I was always fascinated about people that come from places that I don't understand. You know, photography or documentary photography is a great passport to actually explore. Uh, and I try to do it as much as possible. This is Purim, uh, the Israeli Halloween, uh, Jewish Halloween. Uh, one of the things that it's, it's, it's a really fun event. <laughs> we don't just dress up in costumes, especially the children. Ultra-religious people have to get drunk really drunk, to the point that they cannot remember their name. This is the order. And they do. <laughs> well, this is when, uh, because they have to get this drunk, uh, they also don't want to, to, do, uh, to do any harm to anybody, so they, uh, or to themselves. So they group in uh, large synagogues, and they celebrate throughout the nights. And this is the beginning. As you can see, the, that kid is already wiped out. Um, <laughs> This photograph is the last that was photographed within the series. It was actually photographed while I was working on another body of work, which I'm going to show you later. Um, photographing a Muslim prayer is extremely hard. Uh, if you're in front of them, they're basically praying to you, which is very disrespectful. If you're behind them, you're photographing their behinds, which is even more disrespectful. From the side, it just doesn't make a really good picture. So. In 2009, I, I was waiting for one of my subjects in an Arab uh, city, and uh, suddenly I heard that there was the Friday prayer. So I walked to the mosque, and uh, I know that everybody there knows that I'm Jewish, so it was a little bit w was a, of a weird situation, and I asked if I can enter and photograph. And amazingly, it, I, I received amazing hospitality, and all I was asked to do is respect, which I did. I started climbing up, again, not wanting to be in front of people, and suddenly, 
you get this magical moment, which I was very, very grateful. I sent this picture to the person that I was photographing just as a present, as a memoir. And next time I came to the village about half, half a year later, I was like, you're the tall photographer with the picture from the mosque. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was fun to give back in this way. Circles go around quite a bit. And not necessarily only in religion, in community. This, these are um, a group of evangelic priests in the Jordan River. They were baptizing uh, 600, uh, 600 pilgrims. Eventually they wanted to baptize and be baptized themselves, so this for, they formed this uh, formation. Uh, I'm both looking in the series as a group of people and how they behave, but also at individuals and the mental places that they reach in this, in, in this case. Uh, that's, this was taken half an hour or one hour earlier. Um, this is an Ethiopian prayer in Jerusalem. Uh, the Holy Sepulchre Church is one of the craziest places on earth. It's split between seven different sects. The Ethiopians are not even one of those seven sects, so they have a small church adjacent to the Holy Sepulchre Church, just on the side. Uh, very beautiful prayers. Uh, this was taken, also one of the earlier ones, before I even knew that I was going to work on this on, as a series. Um, it's in a place, a tomb in Israel, where it's believed for the younger women, if they pray very passionately, they have a higher chance of finding a good husband and being very fertile, which is very important in Judaism. So, good luck. Um, again, that tension. You know, there's things that I'm hoping make you smile, and there's things that I hope you know, make, you, make you think. This is in Hebron, one of the craziest places on earth. 400 Jews living among 40,000 Palestinians. And whenever the Jews want to take a walk through the center of the town, they have to be escorted by the army just to keep them safe. And this kid just doesn't care. Pretty amazing. Uh, Kaparot ceremony, this is something that would not really happen very comfortably in the U.S. The idea is to swirl a hand above your head three times saying a prayer, and which transcends all of your sins into the hand, which is later slaughtered so you can live. Yeah. Um, and this was the same area with the women praying passionately um, in order to find a husband. So a, it's, it's a part of a very large prayer of about half a million ultra-Orthodox people. So again, the private moments uh, interest me as much as the more public moments. Um, sometimes the gods of photography <laughs> just look at you and say, like, shoot, I just organized everything. Uh, I was looking, this is the entrance of the Holy Sepulchre Church. And I was looking at these two people, you know, just one next to each other, totally unaware of each other's presence. So, and, and you know that once you're going to pick up the camera, you, you might have one shot, if you're lucky. So I was looking at this, hoping they don't move eventually. Okay, here we go. The second shot, she already turned. But, one. Um, in 2007, uh, I usually, by the way, work on different projects in parallel, at least some of them, so belief spread across five years. In that uh, time frame, uh, early in 2007, I suddenly heard, I read on the, in the newspaper that uh, there's two or three hundred refugees from Sudan living in Israel, or kind of being incarcerated in Israel. I was totally shocked, you know, that, you know, we, uh, we all heard about the, the atrocities in Darfur and about the genocide there, and I was just shocked that people from Sudan chose to make all the long way to Israel. First of all, because they were survivors of one genocide coming to the, um, no, not this one, uh, survivors of one genocide coming to a, a country that was built basically after a genocide or as a result of a genocide, uh, but also because most of them are Muslims or Christians and they're coming to a Jewish country. So a lot of it didn't make sense. And when it doesn't make sense, I get interested. Uh, so I contacted the reporter and uh, asked her if, you know, she can tell me a little bit about what was happening and I started the project which I thought at that time I'm going to do a small story, maybe have it published. That was the idea. Um, now, I started off when there were 300 re uh, refugees in Israel. Now there's over 65,000. Uh, apparently, I don't know, uh, I just came very early. Uh, this was taken a few months later, uh, and it's a dress of a Sudanese girl that was caught on the border fence. This is the border fence between Israel and Egypt. Uh, it was caught on the border fence as they were running away from the Egyptian army trying to cross into Israel. Uh, the Israeli uh, military fixed the fence, as you can see. This is two days later, already fixed. But they left the dress over there, kind of as a monument. And they would do that across the fence, which was pretty interesting. The f one of the first pictures I photographed was this one, uh, which was in Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Israel. There was a group of 12 Sudanese uh, visiting there. 
And that was one of the most emotional parts of my career, you know, just going with these people, trying to just understanding that there's no way you're going to understand what they're, hap what they're thinking, what they're going through, just w witnessing something of a different people, but reflecting on, them, on themselves. Um, I started working on this project, uh, very problematic in the beginning, uh, just hardly any access, because most of them were incarcerated in prison for no reason, uh, than just trying to defy other people from coming. Those that were released were released just because the, the, the prisons got f overcrowded. So like this group, for instance, they were released under uh, restrictive custody to a settlement that, where they would work and get paid, but they would not be able to leave the settlement. Um, a few months later, uh, more and more refugees started coming, and uh, Tel Aviv started, uh, started getting refugees as well. Tel Aviv is pretty far from the Egyptian border, and it's you know, in kind of a different mindset. Um, and this is not Juarez, New York. That, that's part, more or less the, the equivalent, you know, that people from, you know, just people across the border got all the way to Tel Aviv. And we started having shelters being formed. There was, this is one of the first two shelters. The same reporter you know, sort of called me and said, like, you have to come see this. And so we go there and we go to a place called the Bulldog, which used to be a, a karaoke bar when I was a kid. And I really embarrassed myself there a number of times. Uh, but now I go and see 200 people from the Ivory Coast and uh, Eritrea and, and Sudan living in unhuman conditions. And their only shower was formed in the kitchen, which used to be the kitchen of the Bulldog. Um, I photographed the shower and you know, empty, and I, th I thought that it doesn't really transcend what I want to say and, you know, how poor the situation is. So I kind of waited, and suddenly this gentleman comes over, and I find myself starting to talk to him and explaining to him what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, and eventually asking if I can join him and photograph him while he's taking a shower and how important it is, and promising him that I'm going to really respect, you know, his privacy as much as I can. Not only that, I remember specifically actually explaining to him that he can say no which is kind of something that sometimes documentary photographers forget. Okay, we have a lot of power as, as photographers. And a lot of people, especially in hard situations, are afraid to say no because they don't want to get in trouble. You know, if I would call a, police, a policeman, the guy would be in jail. So it was really important for me to tell him, it's, it's really your choice. And after he said yes, again, verifying it, I went into the shower with him and I re specifically remember, you know, just photographing and thinking to myself, what the hell am I doing? And every talk that I have, I show this picture because I think this is a critical thing. For me, it was you know, a very crystal clear moment of making clear how important ethics is and how easily it's, you can go the other way. Photograph this picture. He actually saw this afterwards, and he was very happy with the picture. And again, it's also, there's also an issue of respect here, which I think is critical because how many times have you gone or opened the papers or gone to an exhibition and you saw pictures that you felt were not respectful? Quite a few times. When that happens, how, how much can you respect the photographer? Or the, even how much can you relate to whatever is being photographed? I see this connection between photographer, subject, and viewer. which I, There has to be respect on all three angles. Once you actually give that, you, you allow the pictures to be much more effective. And I try to keep that, especially in this case. So I continued to photograph this, and again, after a few months, there was another stage where we had uh, thousands of refugees starting to cross the border. This was in jail, actually, one of the earliest pictures. Um, but when we had thousands of people crossing into Israel, suddenly, for instance, in Tel Aviv, we started opening the bomb shelters. Uh, instead of, you know, they, they housed the refugees. Uh, the bomb shelters were so crowded or unhuman at one place in terms of hygiene that some of them just prefer to live outside. This is called Independence Garden in Tel Aviv. In the back you have the Hilton. And uh, so a group of 50 Eritrea went there and uh, spent a week. And the only reason they left was because the Israeli government understood that they were giving, getting very bad publicity because of this. So they gave them passes, to st gave them uh, permits to stay in Israel and spread them all across just so they are away from the journalists. Uh, in some cases, it actually, we, we managed to find what we call a win-win situation. Uh, there was a group of hotels in the south of Israel, in, in two recreational cities, that managed to get permits for a thousand refugees, which they brought in as a workforce. They gave them housing, um, basic necessities, salaries, everything, and even, even the communities. And in response, they get a very uh, joyful and happy and uh, effective workforce. But unfortunately, this did not happen much. 
uh, instead Israel started building concentration camps or detention camps, I'm sorry for the equivalence. Um, so uh, we built a detention camp that in initially had a thousand people, then it got to three thousand people, afterwards five thousand people and it continued to grow. Not only that, Israel started, uh, and I'm a little bit ashamed to say that or hurting at least, they start uh, legislating all kinds of uh, undemocratic laws about not being even able to help those refugees and if you if you assist them you might actually go into jail. Um, the fear was that there was hundreds of thousands of refugees in, in Egypt trying to cross into Israel so Israel did not want to lose its Jewish um, definition or try to handle now a situation of hundreds of thousands of refugees. One can understand the fear. I, it's the same fear that you know we in America face with various borders especially the one with Mexico but there's different ways of handling it. And what even shocks me even more, that Israel was one of two countries, together with the US, to change the UN Treaty back in 1952, um, after, um, after the Holocaust, that every country must accept refugees, even if it's from an enemy country. Israel doesn't. We managed to stop people from coming, in a way. Unfortunately, in a very, what I think is one of the worst things Israel ever did. Uh, but there, and now Israel is sending those refugees back through third countries or it's called uh, living out of free will, which I'm not sure it's always the case. I exhibit this work in uh, Colombia in 2008 uh, uh, as a part of a group exhibition, as Jaime said, at the Museum in Antioquia. And when I went there to give lectures and workshops, suddenly I learned about the displaced uh, situation that was in Colombia. Uh, over 10% of the population in Colombia is displaced because of... Um, fights between the guerrilla, the paramilitary groups, and the, and the army over the last 25 years or more. So basically what happens is that one day you come back from, home, uh, from, from work or from the field and you have a paramilitary person in your house telling you that it's not your house anymore and you should go. And if you don't, they shoot you, or at least the father, and then they let the rest of the family leave. Um, so I, again, when I don't understand, I. I get interested. So I started the project while I was there and then I, I found some connections and went back. And I worked on it, I, I visited Colombia a couple of times. Uh, it was very important for me to show all the, all, the, all the line from the villages like this one. This is a village controlled by the guerrilla. Um, and until uh, Medellin, for instance, which has 53 different neighborhoods of displaced people. Now, displacement is already kind of a natural thing in Colombia. You know, like you would ask, how long are you displaced? Not if you're displaced. 10 years, 15 years, two years. Some people were new. Um, again, a very sensitive project uh, in terms of just getting the confidence of these people, especially because they were not English speakers, so I had to learn Spanish. Um, anything that would allow you to uh, really understand and actually communicate in, in, in a better way. Uh, I thought back at the time that maybe I want to do now a project about refugees worldwide, extend this to other countries, uh, not only um, refugees because of wars, but also because of natural disasters. But then I started doing some research and I saw that there were quite a few people doing the same thing. So I said, okay, this is taken care of. I, I should go do some, some other things, as you will see. Uh, I was very interested in the spaces in this case, you know, because, because of the issues of displacement and where they're moving to. I thought that the spaces are a critical part of this project, not only the people themselves. Um, this was the first neighborhood that I was photographing it in Medellin. Uh, this is the, the kitchen of the kindergarten, um, basically. And um, as you saw, every picture you saw until now was photographed during the day. And the reason is because it's really dangerous to photograph at night. Uh, in this one, it's also in Medellin. Um, we go to the how this is the fixer of the specific neighborhood, the person that would help me in the specific neighborhood. But then I photographed this pic picture and my translator and fixer were like, Nathan, we really have to leave. Paramilitary groups are going to be in the streets any moment. So we left and as we got to the bus, we actually saw a couple of them running with guns because I had cameras and they wanted the cameras. So night is falling. Um, how are we doing on time? Oh, perfect. Um, well, after doing so much serious stuff, I wanted to get a little bit more, uh, you know, happy or do something a little bit more fastidious. In 2009, Tel Aviv celebrated its centennial year. And I wanted to do something to celebrate it, at least for myself. Uh, that was the place I was living for the, the past decade. And I tried to understand, you know, what made Tel Aviv so special. And I do think, by the way, it's special. It's one of the best cities in the world. Uh, 
after, again, contemplating, I eventually reached the conclusion that what interests me is actually the Tel Avivans themselves. The, the, this mosaic of people from so many different origins, sorry, is what makes Tel Aviv so interesting. So I started photographing the Tel Avivians, people that inhabit Tel Aviv, either work, live. Uh, and I'm showing you this, it's a very small project, you know, more as a transition to the next one. Because as photographers, we always care for to have, you know, a very definite uh, style that brands us and allows us to get, you know, either more works or allows a, a, a better or easier reading of the, of the work. But I, hello, but I uh, really enjoy actual development in my work and trying to explore different types of photography. It, it keeps me going. It keeps the passion going as well. So this was when I did my first steps into um, environmental portraiture. Not before that I would be photographing for magazines, but it would be much more clean according to whatever the, the photo editor wanted. This was kind of what I wanted. And uh, this was one of my favorites. The guy is called Moshe Dayan, 90 years old. Goes to the beach every day. Pretty sharp guy. <coughs> And this one was photographed on the 10th, day, 10th anniversary of the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin as part of a bigger project with a few other photographers. Now, I'm showing you this again because it's transitioning to a, a body of work which uh, was photographed when I was, this is my thesis project when I was at SVA. So if we're here, I thought that this is the place to show it actually. Um, as I told you, I, I lived in Israel for 36 years before moving here. But uh, even though I lived there for so long, uh, I always felt that I, there was a large part of Israel that I never really understood. We always think of Israel as the, the Jewish country, right? 20% uh, yeah. of Israel is not Jewish. It's actually Arabs, citizens of Israel, not uh, Palestinians in the West Bank or Gaza, uh, citizens of Israel. Um, people that have, are descendants of families that have lived in the area before Israel was established. Christian, Muslim, Druze, Bedouins. And I wanted to photograph and truly try to understand this kind of people that were lost in translation. Everybody is talking about the Palestinians in the West Bank in Gaza or the Jewish people of Israel. And, we, and the, the conflict is highly documented and we see it all the way in the news. We forget that there's almost two million people in the middle that are kind of torn between their nationality and their origins. And these were the people I wanted to focus on. So I went on a personal voyage and I decided to focus on people that were 18 years old. I did not want to um, create another body of work that was about you know, having imagery of conflict. We have that. That would not help the conversation. If you go and Google on, you know, just search on Google, Arab Israeli kid, you're going to get a gallery of images that is going to be very frightening of a lot of kids holding bombs or uh, guns and whatever. Living in Israel, I knew that this was not the situation. And I wanted to create some kind of visual narrative that was different in that and was allowing some kind of different conversation. I also didn't want to photograph the older generation that was already convinced and they knew what was wrong and what was right and how things were going to be. I wanted to create something more forward-looking. So I chose 18. 18 is the age where uh, people in Israel graduate from high school. They become adults. They're being accepted into society. And they're beginning the right to vote. But as opposed to the majority of the Jewish population that goes to the military, the majority of the Arab population doesn't. So it's also the separation point between the two societies. It's also a, pr a time of personal conflict for those young people uh, that have to think about work, about most of the things that we think in the States, about work, about uh, studies, about family. For the Jewish people, it happens three years later, after the military. So one question. Yeah. They don't go to the military because they're dismissed, or...? Uh... Yeah. They, it's allowed for them not to go to the military just because they're Arabs. There's only one section which, which is called the Druze. The men, the Druze men go to the military. It's in a way, it's because of historical suspicion, engraved suspicion, because they come from a, um, a background that might put them in a situation that they have to be conflicted, sometimes even with family members. So it's both a, a, a suspicion by the, by the Israeli government or nation. It's also in a place not wanting to put them in this situation, to force them now to go into a Palestinian village and, or go into Gaza. Some of them have families there. Uh, now, Muslims and Christians can volunteer and then they have to go through a screening process just wanting to verify that security-wise they're okay. But not, not m many of them do. And usually whoever does is uh, people that don't have many opportunities outside the army. So this is for them some kind of way to have a better life. Um, so yeah, and some of them do it, you know, more out of ideology. 
which is very, which is fascinating. And this was also part of the project. I spent a few months just researching, uh, you know, the whole the whole society because it's really easy to make a mistake in thinking, you know, I, I've lived here for 36 years. I know, right? If I would do that, I would photograph the same stereotypes that I grew up on, and I wanted to walk away from that. So it was also important for me to understand that. As much as I think of myself as a liberal person, or as I, or I want to do things differently, there's some subconscious barriers that I have to overcome, and I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily be able to overcome them myself. So what happened was, with each and every person that I would meet, I, I photographed eventually 64 people. Uh, I would start first with an interview, trying to understand what's their story, what do they like, where, where they're coming from, what their family, what are their fears, what are their hopes. Um, a lot of things of them as human beings. You know, we, sometimes we would talk politics, but mostly not. And after that, I would explain to them what, the, what, it is, what does it mean to be represented by a picture? What is a portrait? So I could incorporate them in the decision made for making those portraits. We would choose together in what they would wear, where they would be photographed. Obviously, I would be interested in photographing something that would look interesting. But it was also, always also have to be something that represents them in some sort of way. And afterward, I would stay, stay with them another few hours, just photographing their lives. Uh, and so, in creating basically a body of work that has three parts. The portraits, which are exhibited or published together with a, te with a short testimony out of that interview, and a series of pictures of daily life images that is more of an invitation to get closer. And I brought a few examples here. This is Muhammad. Um, he's in Nazareth. Uh, he's a Muslim. He was arrested for trying to throw stones at Israeli police. He spent a month in jail. And now he, well, when I was photographing that, he was with a um, bracelet around his ankle, uh, not allowed to leave, the, to leave the house for more than uh, a few hours and a couple of days. Um, the pillow here has the cover of the most famous Israeli children's book, which was kind of interesting. I, I found that up only after I was photographing. Um, this is Dina. She was the last person being photographed. Uh, and she has a pretty crazy story. She was born for a Jewish Israeli mother and a, sorry, Jewish Ukrainian mother and an Arab Israeli Muslim father in the Ukraine. When she was five years old, the family moved to Israel and stayed in, a, in an Arab city. And when she was 18, she left her family and moved into Jaffa, Tel Aviv Jaffa, which is a mixed city. So one thing that I would ask each and every person is how do you define yourselves? Because the whole generation is kind of in an identity crisis. Uh, well, she said, you know, I have a Palestinian, I have both uh, Ukrainian uh, and Israeli passports. I'm considered Jewish because of my mother and Muslim because of my father. So I basically I can be whatever you want. But if you ask me, I'm a human rights activist. Now, she was one of only two people throughout the project to identify themselves by what she was doing and not, not by her religion or by her political views or by her origin. The interesting thing is that the other person had the ultra opposite problem. He was from the um, north, from um, Syria, uh, area around Syria, where people don't have, they relinquish their, their IDs. They don't want Israeli citizenship. They are still loyal to Syria. So the guy told me, you know, Israel doesn't want me. Syria doesn't want me. I hate this village. I cannot get, wait to get out of here. Would it help you if I said that I'm a musician? So. Otherwise, it was always, I'm an Arab Israeli, I'm a Palestinian living in an occupied country, I'm a Muslim living here. People would try to find some kind of politically correct or very not correct definition, depending on you know, how they would feel. This one, one of the more loaded uh, interactions. Uh, Bara, his brother was killed by the Israeli military during uh, confrontations in the uh, year 2000, uh, very famous ones. Uh, he was named a mortar, and he turned all the family from peace promoters or peace activists to anti-Israeli activists. And I came to him and I asked to, to him, to, I, 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 got, I reached him through a friend that was part of the project. And so I, I got to the house and I was explaining what I wanted to do. And um, I said, you know, it, this doesn't have to be political. It's more about you as a person. So he said, like, I have two things for you to say. First of all, you're the only person that is going to, you're the first person photographing me since my, father, my brother died. Why? Because you're the first person asked about me and not about my brother. Second of all, if you're not talking politics, you're not getting into this house. When we started talking, you know, he was accusing Israel and is for a lot of things. And at one point I was asking him, uh, Bara, how do you feel about me, a Jewish Israeli, doing this with you? So it's like, you know, I try to, fo to forget that you're an Israeli and try to remember you're a man. You know, don't change my words. Tell them as they are, you know, and 
if, if, I can, if I can do that and you can come here and ask you know, to sit with me after what happened, maybe there's still a chance. And it was pretty amazing, you know, after all that, that hopefully I was on the right track. This was one of the earlier ones. I chose the, the language of environmental portraits because I felt that the environment will tell as much as a story about the person as the person itself. Nothing is staged here in terms of like, we, I, we at least I didn't organize it. They were, knew that I was coming, so maybe they cleaned the rooms a little bit. That's true. But this guy, he was the fourth person photographed. He was, he was the brother of my fixer's fiance. And we go into this room <laughs> and suddenly my, me and my fixer are like, whoa, <laughs> what just happened? The guy renovated his room a week ago, painting it pink and having two things on the walls. I, I, if you guys know semiotics, I'm a big, I'm a, I have a big fascination about semiotics and about things and what do they mean about, you know, what people try to tell us through what they own or what they put on the walls in this case. Interesting. Um, this was the lady I was waiting for when I was photographing the mosque. Uh, very interesting conversation about Islam and about how Islam is mis misinterpreted and how it's a beautiful um, religion right now not having the best PR worldwide, let's say. In some cases I had to I came a couple of times, uh, for example, here she just finished high school. Four months later she was already engaged to be married. And um, again that transformation between a woman and a, uh, and a girl was something that was really interesting to me. Now you would notice that all these pictures are taken in very intimate locations, in very intimate perspectives, but the body language is never inviting. And this is basically to testify about the nature of our engagement. I would be photographing 30, 40, 50 pictures of each and every one of these people and afterwards looking at the film, wanting to choose what is actually representative of what was happening there, I was looking for the picture where they didn't pose. Every time there would be tension. With the women maybe a little bit more gentle, with the men a little bit more aggressive, for example, but there was always, will always be tension. Uh, this is Mohanad, He's, he used to be the Israeli champion for his weight class. Uh, he wanted to get out of Israel and go to a place that there would be less uh, discrimination. Uh, this, this would be his training gym. This one in a, big, a bigger gym in a, in a Jewish city. And uh, this is uh, Anan. It is written there, Allah bil Allah, which is, means uh, there is nobody but God. Um, she's a Bedouin from a very, very strict sect. Now, to come to get the permission to photograph her, I would not have to ask her. I would go to, to the father. The father owns her literally owns her until she gets married and then the husband owns her. Owns her. That's the word. She's a property. She has to do whatever she's being told. So I sit with the father, I explain about the product, he loves it, he calls her, he's like, okay, this is Nathan, you have to be photographed. He's like, no, 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 no. I need, to, so I ask for his permission to ask for her permission. I'm, I'm explaining to him without her actually taking part of it voluntarily, it will not work. So I ask for his permission to ask for her permission. He gives me her, his permission. I go to her and ask for her permission. She's like, I'm not the one to give you the permission, the father. So she asks so ask her father for her permission to give me a permission. The father gives her permission to give me a permission. And then we have all permissions, right? So I pick up the, and I start the interview. And then fire goes out. <laughs> she start, I feel that, you know, I'm waiting for somebody very subdued. No, she's a feminist. Uh, Women should have more rights with the Bedouin society. She was shouting at the father, that's it, you gave me permission, now I can talk. You know, we need to, get we need to study more, we need to get out of the house, we cannot be here just uh, producing babies all the time, I cannot be a property, I'm a person, I need to be regarded as a person. I'm like, oh my God. So, women were much more interesting, I have to say, in this project. They had so much more to say, as in life, probably. Um, but it was, uh, it was one of the more pleasant experiences. And afterwards, when I was photographing her, she was, she was bossing me, like, okay, that's it, you're done. <laughs> uh, no, actually, I think it's going to be a very lucky one. He's going to have, we say in Hebrew, Ezer Kenegdo, which means something against you to help you. Which I think is pretty beautiful. Um, this is Jihad. Yes? Just a quick question. Almost always natural. So, yeah. Um, the question is, how are these portraits lit? Uh, almost all of them are natural light. Some of them I would use a, a small flash of, like that I would use like with a transmitter. At the beginning, I would actually also use uh, the, the, the lights of the video. I would use it as, as help. But from everything that you see, maybe two of them have extra light. Otherwise, long, longer exposures, uh, I would actually like them to concentrate. When it's longer exposure, if they don't concentrate, they move a little bit, and then it's not sharp. 
which was pretty interesting. Again, if somebody would just relax and concentrate, that was the moment I was looking for. So it also f uh, served as a filter mechanism. They stayed still. They stayed still because suddenly they were relaxed. Now, Jihad was one of the only people I got to by mistake. We had a, another meeting was canceled. So I took my fixer and said, like, okay, let's go to the worst place in town. So like, no, it's very dangerous. Like, let's go there. So we go there and we find Jihad with a couple of his mates. And this is really hood area. Uh, so we tell him about the project. He's like, is anybody here 18? So like, all three of us. So like, welcome to the project. <laughs> so uh, they were so shocked that an Israeli photographer would want to photograph them that they were the most hospitable group of people I've ever met. Like, they were just so excited and they were just wanting to tell me about their life and whatever. So I interviewed Jihad, which means holy war, by the way. He's the leader of a gang. He's the leader of the gang. Um, interesting, uh, in a way. Um, so. With, I, I want to photograph him, and then Jihad starts, you know, posing like this and like that. And I'm like, Jihad, look at me. So like, no. And I'm like, why don't you look at me? So like, the subject who should never look at the camera. It doesn't make a good picture. And I'm like, what do you mean, Jihad? So like, I look at magazines. The fact that I'm a gang leader doesn't mean I'm stupid. <laughs> so it was uh, harder to convince him. But uh, he became one of the more interesting people in the project. And um, this is, for instance, the transition. After I would take their portraits, I would just stay with them and trying to create something much more intimate. If you're thinking about the Arab-Israeli, Palest the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, you would not be thinking in terms of these images. Um, some of them are metaphorical. Hopefully, some of them are more to indicate about you know, the, the, the context of you know, how the conflict or the, the livelihood affected them. This is Iman. She still belongs to her father. Um, remember the girl that was engaged to be married? So the hijab um, has also very bad PR. And sometimes we forget that there's a woman under it. Um, that was kind of a magical moment between her and her sister before the sister has to wear it. Um, this was a, very, a, a family that came from a very bad um, economical background. Uh, about 15 people living in a room and a half. I was really interested in all kinds of, again, in semiotics, what, what things they put on the wall and rugs and, you know, the, a lot of things around here, you know, really make sense. This is maklube, which is rice with chicken and uh, vegetables cooked the upside down. Uh, it's one of the best things you're gonna, ever going to taste. If you ever have a chance to eat maklube, eat. Um, now, you would notice that uh, there's only men around the table. This is Friday dinner. The women eat only after the men are done. Um, I'm not going to go through every, everything. Um, this is uh, a young guy whose father used to be the, uh, one of the leaders of the mob in the city, you know, controlling drugs and women trafficking. He was assassinated by his own bodyguards. And the second that happened, all of the brothers were forced into a blood vengeance, meaning they cannot leave the city until they kill the people that killed their father. So the future of this young guy is terminated at age, was terminated at the, age, at the age of 16. Our friend Jihad again, whenever I'm sh showing this, especially to Israelis, it was like, weren't you afraid? And I'm like, no. On the contrary, you know, that just the fact that we think that we should be afraid uh, takes us away from, you know, what we actually might be able to get. Um, we go again to Amram, you know, the girl engaged to be married. Uh, she was helping her, uh, her sister during her homework, and afterwards she, her sister leaves the room. And there's a situation, me alone with an Arab woman, a very uncomfortable situation. So she goes to the door, and I expect her to open the door wide, you know, so nobody would second guess what is happening inside. Instead, she goes and closes the doors almost, you know, almost to the end, and comes and asks me, have you ever been in love? And I'm like, okay, this is the last question I thought I'm going to have, but <laughs> yes, why? How does it feel? And I'm like, why are you asking me this, Sanram? So like, well, I'm engaged to be married. This is the first time in my life I'm allowed to love somebody. And I don't know what I'm feeling, and I have nobody to talk to about this. You know, you're, because you're Jewish, I can talk to you about this. So we start talking about love, you know, and get to the bed, and we sit down, and we talk in Hebrew and English and Arabic, kind of a mix. Uh, and then she, we start talking about God, and I'm telling her, I don't believe in God. And she's like, how can you not? She's a very strict Muslim woman. How can you not believe in God? We have our God. You have, you have your God. Yeah. And I'm sorry. So we have a, a, a long talk about love and religion and faith. And at one point, I'm asking her, Anram, would you ever imagine that you would sitting on your bed talking to a Jewish 
uh, men, double your age, about love and faith. So like, not in a million years. So like, this is the essence of this project. Now, normally, this is the end. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> not today. So this is the first time I'm presenting this, so I'm a little bit uh, excited and, um, <laughs> yes. Um, first time I came to New York was in 1997. Um, I remember every, all my friends telling me, you know, New York is like Tel Aviv, just big, <laughs> really big. And when I exited the, the subway at Trocofiller Center for the first time, my, my breath was literally taken away. You know, I was just trying to understand what was happening around me. It took me a few minutes, but eventually I got to my senses. In the days to come, uh, just walking the streets, I was not amazed only by the size of the buildings and the avenues. I was just seeing a kaleidoscope of advertising everywhere I was going. I was looking up and there was ads. <laughs> Obviously Times Square, but not only Times Square, everywhere. And this was nothing that I was accustomed to. We didn't have this in Israel. In the years to come, we started having it similarly. But then when I moved here in 2008 uh, to go to the SVA, uh, I started noticing that uh, all, all this phenomena has gotten much, much bigger. And those billboards have moved from up, they moved down to street level. Uh, three weeks after moving here, um, I, w I had to go and photograph because my teacher at SVA said, you know, you have to bring something to class. So I took my camera and uh, went to what I was thinking of as uh, the symbol of the American dream, Fifth Avenue. I walked around kind of as a street photographer and suddenly I photographed this. Actually, I, well, this was the third or fourth picture being photographed. I was kind of shocked just that this happened and uh, the thing on the left were more, was more interesting, but suddenly this woman came here and that moment happened. I continued walking around uh, and uh, around 52nd Street, I came across another one. So this is Juicy Couture. So I photographed those pictures, bundled <coughs> them together, like, uh, 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 not friends, uh, and brought them to class. And I actually remember, you know, uh, it was master critique, so everybody's telling you how good you are, bad you are, whatever, trying to help. And eventually I was thinking, okay, there's two interesting pictures here. They're just so different that anything, I, everything I've done before, I don't know what to do with this. So I said, okay, two good pictures, let's continue. And I continued doing a lot of other stuff. But eventually, this thing just stayed in my mind. And wherever I was going around along the years, I was still keeping to f keep, keep photographing it. There's an interesting thing what happens when you move to New York as a foreigner. Coming here as a tourist is very easy. You photograph insanely. Everything is interesting. Monuments, people, street life, candy, everything is interesting. When you move here, everything starts being different, either banal or just part of your life and sometimes even cliché, or at least photography was it cliché. It took me a while to really understand what is my relationship to New York and what do I want to say about it. I didn't just want to react to it, I actually want to say something a little bit or make you guys contemplate on a couple of things. Two, three years later I actually came to an understanding that you know, this is different than what I'm, I'm doing, but this is another development which I want to try to do. So I start following these billboards all across the city. Um, it's kind of an exploration of a very fluid uh, cityscape. Uh, or landscape of the city. Before you, we used to have uh, graffiti or just facades. Now the facades are covered by these billboards that disappear after a few weeks. Uh, I was talking to uh, Jaime before we, we came here and we talked about how much is it like a Fata Morgana. It's kind of creating this idea of something very lucrative coming, you know, <laughs> coming, uh, pulling you in when eventually, you know, it offers you not that much. Uh, and it disappears after a while, as you get closer. Um, I was looking for juxtapositions, uh, both in size, but not only in size, also obviously in content. Mm -hmm. Trying to really explore the, the difference between this cinematographic reality that was offered to us and the reality that was actually happening uh, by the people, the street furniture, how I like to call it, and everything that inhabits this sign. How people are actually kind of pulled into this cinematographic stage without even being aware of this. Um, the pictures were photographed during the last two, th two years mostly, and a, a few in 2008, mm -hmm. along the main uh, city areas in 5th uh, you know, Avenue, 34th Street, Herald uh, Square, Times Square. It's pretty amazing that almost no, at any point I was, I was trying really to see how much people are aware of this, how much is this kind of advertising actually effective. If you would think of it, um, it's the only medium that you cannot turn off. You can change the channel, you can close the TV, you can drop the paper, 
Here it's kind of democratic, but not really. You have to pass through that space. Is it effective? Is it not? Most people would not notice them. And when I would be talking to and showing this to you know, colleagues of mine, Americans had no idea those billboards were, were there. I don't know, maybe it's because the American culture is so saturated with advertising that we shut it off in an automatic way. Foreigners would. So again, an interesting anecdote along the way. Uh, those small moments, sometimes I would have to, you know, I was really lucky like in the first couple of times that the, the situation just presented itself. Sometimes I would return to the, to the sign over and over again, trying to find the real moment that for me represented what I wanted to say, mm -hmm. trying to understand what was happening here. Mm -hmm. So through a series of, con you know, trying to confuse you, but not only to confuse you, um, I tried to explore this. And, you know, I, I think I look at this, uh, the people in the advertisers, um, you know, I compare it a little bit to uh, Roman or Greek times, or a lot of empires used to have a lot of statues that would be the symbols of those cultures. In the, um, in the at least New York urban landscape, we don't have that space for those kind of statues, unless you go to the Met or to some kind of parks that occasionally we have a statue. These are our new statues. These are both symbolize our culture and try to create it at the same time. It was sometimes just ridiculous how unaware people were. <laughs> Especially in this one. Again, gods of photography can be very nice to you sometimes. So thank you Dolce Gabbana. Um, it was also just even the content of the ads was very fascinating. This is an ad for uh, um, a real estate company. What sells a real estate company better than a very sexy woman? I guess nothing. I know. And especially I was contemplating, you know, those ladies that younger or older ladies, you know, how does this again affect them on a subconscious level mostly? Um, it was very easy to, you know, to go after the trap of uh, homeless people, of people that are unfortunate, but this was nothing that I wanted to do. But in one case, I just couldn't help myself. Um, I photographed this picture of Zara about a year ago, and among this was this lady, well, we don't have that much resolution down there. In the, in the beginning, I thought to myself, you know, it's not a very effective picture. You can hardly see her. But then, talking to a friend, I actually understood that this is a perfect metaphor for where we are right now. We, we don't like to look at the people that are unfortunate. We prefer to look at <coughs> the beautiful things around them. But eventually, if we really pay attention, they're there. They're not disappearing. That person, the interesting thing was that I photographed her the same day that I photographed the first pictures, at the, more or less the same location with the same blanket. And I photographed her again two weeks ago, again, next to another sign. Same blanket, same person, same place. Um, and sometimes we just don't have it. And again, so in a weird way, if this looks to you guys weird by the end of this lecture, Maybe I touched the spot. So we talked about the exhibition. You're more than welcome to come. It's going to happen a week from now in Anastasia Photo Gallery. It's on the Lower East Side. So I will be really happy to, if you guys would come. There's going to be a few prints on the walls. You can see it not only on the screen, but it actually looks as a print. Uh, and God knows if we are in the uh, digital media department, you guys should know a couple of things about prints. So hopefully you're going to enjoy it. And if not, come and tell me what I did wrong. <laughs> Questions? Nada? Oops. <laughs> Jaime, over there. I'm curious, you talked about natural light and using natural light and just an off-camera flash, but what type of equipment do you actually use and how much uh, processing do you do afterwards? Okay. Um, given the fact that I have to move very freely and I also don't want my equipment to be in intimidating to the subject, I photograph with 35 mi digital cameras, millimeter, Canon, try to stay at the top of the technology, uh, both for the larger file sizes as well as the better processing. Um, I use a set of, of lens, um, 1635, 24-70, I'm actually in the process of at least wanting to move into uh, fixed lenses, more for the quality. Now, in terms of the processing, 
I do, opa, I do processing, but not that much. I, it, it's more of a processing of preparing it for print. I do think that there's a very big difference, and it, there, there was always a difference between what you capture on film or as a file and what you eventually print. Then having said that, uh, we talked about ethics. In the kind of work that I'm photographing, I think that ethics has to be maintained and the kind of processing that, that I'm doing must not alter what was photographed in terms of the contents or even the, the spirit that it was photographed. So sometimes it's very tempting. I try not to go overboard because once you cross it, that's it. And I'm, I have to say I'm very frustrated with looking you know, at winners of competitions, especially recent ones. Uh, that you obviously see that it was so heavily processed that in a way I, I think it doesn't res respect the medium. Now, the photographers that are doing that, in, in a way they're cutting the branch which, on which they're sitting. Uh, do, do you guys have it in English, this kind of phrase? This is, comes from Hebrew, that we cut the branch on which we're sitting. Anyway, um, for the reason is that people don't believe news journalism or documentary photography anymore, right? Everything looks fo Photoshop. Or if it's a good picture, you obviously Photoshop it then. I, I don't know if you guys were here a, week, a month ago for the lecture of Philip Toledano. Mm -hmm. I showed this stuff to Philip, we are friends, uh, a few weeks ago, and he was like, why don't you just put pe pe picture f uh, people from different pictures together, you know, create the perfect one? <laughs> so like, I don't want to do that. So like, but it doesn't hurt, you know, the ideas that you want to talk about. You know, you're an artist, you can do this. Like, yeah, but this is what I force myself to do. So I do process them in terms of sharpness, color corrections, contrast cleaning, you know, things like that, but everything that you would see, if I would show you the raw file, you would see wherever it, where it got from. Yeah. Yeah, right in the back. Just a second, I'm going to give you something so people on the video can actually hear you as well. Yeah. Kind of along the same lines, I'm wondering how many pictures do you take of each subject if, you know, on average, does well, that? It, it differs um, uh, across the projects. Uh, if we take 18, for instance, um, I think there were about 40, 50,000 pictures taken there. Uh, we do have to consider it about 50, 60 days of work, intensive days of work. Um, and out of that, eventually, I'm showing usually 36, 18 portraits and 18 daily life. There's a larger, like the larger selection has 80 pictures. Uh, part of it, for instance, is the same portrait being photographed over and over until it's the crystal one. With the billboards, it's different. Some billboards have three pictures. Some billboards have 40 pictures. Very rarely it's going to be, you know, anything more than, you know, more than that. If, 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 if I return to the place a number of times, then there would, there would be more. I think I looked at, uh, I teach at the ICP, so I, sh I, I use this as an example of, you know, working on a, a, a project. I think now I, I saved, they're still saved about 1,500 um, pictures from about 50 days of shooting. Yeah, so that's, yes. I have, well, two things. I love the idea of if I don't understand something, it interests me. And yeah. I think that's very open, and that's, that's what I'm going to take from this evening. Um, but I'm also interested in that you, you, know, you, you had a, a, a career, you, know, you were successful, Maybe unhappy, um, Not maybe but unhappy. but but how does you know how does that does that career influence you now or as a photographer? I'm wondering. Well, I, I think that it's important for you know to be inspired and uh, you know you are what you are. So since the career was let's let's say it has its benefits in terms of technological elements that I'm a little bit more equipped um, around the, the technological area. But also, you know, knowing how to handle myself, uh, not only as, uh, you know, uh, when I go and photograph, but also how I market myself, how I look at myself as a professional. There's a lot of, it's, it, it takes, it take, it's a hard job of being a photographer. It's not only knowing how to compose or how to process a picture. This is just one small part of it. Um, but I also, it informed me as a, as a person, uh, you know, throughout my studies. And I guess it also informs me in this way. One thing, we, we talked about respect or being open. so. I remember when I was doing my uh, MBA studies, the one specific lecture about from a person that was the head of a huge company, and he would talk about international uh, business. He said, like, the, one of the main important things about international business is being very sensitive to the culture of the people you're working with and understanding that there's different cultures. And it, right there, it was fascinating to me about, you know, trying to always be in the shoes of the people that you want to 
that are of interest for you. So until this day, whenever I'm photographing, I really take a deep interest in the people I'm photographing. And otherwise it wouldn't work. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, Just a second. Pass the torch. <clears throat> Uh, I really liked your project, the 18 project mm -hmm. in Israel, and I was wondering if you uh, feel like you're going back to that kind of uh, reportage or, or project like here in New York. I mean. Maybe. Um, I think that you have to choose the right photographic strategy for the specific project that you want to work on. You know, that that, that project was in a, in a series of portraits and, uh, and uh, testimonies which was very important because I wanted to go across the board and kind of discuss a situation with the whole society. And their words were critical in, in that sense, much less than in other bodies of work. In the billboards, for instance, you see the separation that, that I have from my subject. I, don't, I never even talk to them. I don't know who they are. They usually disappear before I take the next picture. Very different strategies. But that separation is for me also how I feel about New York and from those billboards as a foreigner or even as a, as a New Yorker. You know, a lot of people have that kind of separation. New York is not that friendly city, you know. I remember getting here in the first year, I, w I had a game, you know, I would get in the, on the subway and I, was try to, I would be trying to make eye contact. Mm -hmm. In Israel, you're in traffic jam, the national sport is looking into everybody else's car. <laughs> like you are making everybody's business your business. Otherwise, you know, sometimes they would be surprised if you're not looking, what does it mean? I'm not interesting? <laughs> here, nobody, like, Nobody creates eye contact. I was kind of, I, I, so that kind of separation is also part of this. So I don't know what my next project is going to be. Actually, I have an idea. And it might actually be the first one where I'm going to stage pictures. Very, it's, you, you're going to know what I'm, you're going to know what I'm doing. Uh, in, there's just not going to be any way around it. But I think that one should use the right photographic strategy. It sometimes can come the other way around because one is very strong in a specific photographic strategy, one would choose a certain type of subject, which is also great. So it depends. I'm, I'm a little bit all over the place. Whenever something interests me, I like, I try. Sometimes I fail. But uh, I remember somebody saying a phrase which I love. I'm an artist and therefore I have an ongoing relationship with failure. <laughs> yeah. Perfect ending. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, everybody. <laughs>